Hello, welcome everyone to today's Learning Resources webinar, Essential Advice Preparing for a Successful School Year. My name is Shannon Howen from Learning Resources and I will be your moderator. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. You cannot use your microphone during this webinar, so we encourage you to submit any questions or comments using the chat function on your screen. If we don't get to your question today, we will follow up with you via email. This webinar is being recorded and available on learningresources.com. You should also receive an email from GoToWebinar with a link to the recording after the workshop. At Learning Resources, we're dedicated to helping parents and their young children navigate the early education journey by providing the most high quality toys and resources. Parent coach and back to school expert, Dr. Ann Louise Lockhart helps parents with kids and teens with behavioral and emotional regulation concerns, those diagnosed with ADHD, anxiety, and highly sensitive kids. She spoke she has spoken nationally at schools, conferences, online podcasts, summits, and corporate workshops about ADHD, anxiety, executive functioning, emotional dysregulation, and racism. She focuses on helping parents adjust their mindset about parenting. Now, I am thrilled to introduce our presenter, Dr. Anne Louise Lockhart. Please take it away. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here and teaming up with Learning Resources. And this free workshop is brought to you and sponsored by Learning Resources. So I'll be discussing school readiness and highlighting specific toys from Learning Resources to help parents and kids prepare for the school year. So I'll talk about some of my favorites and some that I wish were around that my kids were younger so that we could play with those as well, too. So um, so let's go to the next slide. So one of the things that um, we're going to be talking about, several of the things rather, is understanding that play is a child's language and how to prepare kids for preschool in, in kindergarten. This is a big transition for them and for you. Uh, how to prepare yourself for kids entering the classroom and then what to expect once the school day ends and what to do about it. So I'll give you some foundational stuff, which I always love to do with my workshops, but then also giving you some practical strategies when things don't go well and how to how to address that. All right, so what I want to do is we'll present the information, we'll go through everything, make sure that you have a really good foundational understanding of everything that I'm presenting, and then we'll open it up for Q&A and discussions in the chat as well at the end. So we'll be spending a full hour together and we'll leave the last 10 to 15 minutes for all of your questions. So put them in as they pop into your mind as well too. All right, next slide. So. Let's start with play being a child's language. Now, this is something that I love. My background is I'm a pediatric psychologist. I'm board certified in clinical child and adolescent psychology. And one of my first, first training experiences was a play therapy practicum student and then intern. And I worked with K through five students and then junior high students with sand tray and play therapy. And I remember being so blown away by play. And the fact that play therapy is actually an intervention that works really well for kids. So let's talk about play and why it's so important. Now, when we think about adults, the way adults communicate most of the times is through language, through verbal language, through sign language, verbal language, various dialects, slang, all that kind of stuff. Play, however, is a child's first language. That's how they communicate with the world. That's how they figure things out. That's how they work through stresses and things that they're overwhelmed by, how they solve problems, how they make friends, how they learn about themselves and the world and their parents and caregivers. Play is really, really, really important. Now, in this picture, it's a picture of my daughter's best friend. This is from a few years ago in the sand tray. And we were doing a photo shoot because I really wanted to highlight how cool it was. And even though this was a planned photo shoot, she actually got really into it and started building within the tray. And this is because when we're looking at play, this is how kids respond to the world. They start to build. They project onto the sand. They project onto the toys their kind of view of things, what they're struggling with. And so it's very symbolic, but it's very also literal. And it gives us a kind of a bird's eye view of what's happening with our child. So play is super, super important. And I've seen so often with kids, whether they're pre-verbal or limited language skills, or they're not sure how to express their feelings, that play is a great way to connect with them. All right, next slide. 
so the other thing that I want us to, to draw attention to uh, as well is that the with play, it's not just about the nonverbal, the language working out to different kinds of things. They're also learning fine motor skills, grasping things, how to hold things that helps them with writing, that helps them with um, drawing, with coloring once they get to school. So that's really great. Also math, early math skills is learned through play language, language skills, and how to how people communicate in different ways also happens through play. Uh, critical thinking skills, that if I do this, then this. You know, if I open this up, then what happens? Like in the picture, like if I have this and I open up, oh my goodness, what is this? This is super cute. Okay, wait, wait, and then if I do this and I open this, oh, so all of these things are part of critical thinking skills. And it's what kids learn as they are playing. Also interpersonal skills, that it's mine. I'm playing with this. I don't want to play this with you. And or turn taking, sharing your turn, then my turn, but back and forth. And it's what in many circles we call social and emotional learning being able to read people's self-expression, be able to judge what's going on here, being able to know, I wanna play with this kid, let me stay away from this kid. Like this one is not my vibe, this one is. And that's all part of it, the cause and effect. This is one, you know, cause and effect, how things work. You know, when I turn things upside down, what happens? Oh, I learn, oh, and if I shake it really fast, I can get the sand to move even quicker, you know? Or even things like, um, Relaxation jars, I have kids use this. This is one of the toys from learning resources, but we can use it from just a regular old water bottle as well too. So this is the cause and effect. So like, oh, I learn, I can take deep breaths. Oh, I'm very, very upset, I'm very upset. Okay, I can take deep breaths. And so this is a great like calm down solution that I use a lot with kids in play session. And when I'm teaching my intern about these things, like well, you can make these own, um, these with your own kids as well too. So there's so much that kids learn through that. And a big thing that I love talking about is executive function skills. And so that kids learn that planning, decision-making, impulse control, emotional regulation, that's all part of what happens in the play setting. All right, next slide. So, um, oops, all right. And so another thing is that why um, play is so important, uh, independent play specifically, um, is that uh, independent play really helps them learn how to kind of manage and regulate themselves. But honestly, it's also for us because you can't be your kid's entertainer all the time, always playing with them all the time, always supervising them all the time. You need to get a break, you need a nap, you need to cook dinner, you need to bathe the baby, you need to do other things as well too. And so independent play is super important because it helps the child learn that I can manage myself. And so it's super important to have toys and activities and things that they can do besides the screens that helps them learn to manage themselves so that they're not always relying on you to do these things. And that could be done through cards, board games, um, things that they can manipulate and discover, like, you know, the, you know, picking things out, um, but it can also be done through books that they can flip through and color and read. So this independent play is really good because in addition to developing fine motor skills, because if they have a book and they can learn how to take each of the pages and how to turn them, you know, how to take a book and how to turn it, you know, how to hold things, how to take things out, um, how to grasp things, those are all part of independent play. And it really helps give them a sense of confidence that they can do things on their own, that they don't always need their mom, their dad, their caregiver, their nanny, they don't need them all the time to do it, that they can feel a sense of accomplishment of themselves. So there's so many different ways I can go on and on about play and why it's so important, but these are really, really important to pay attention to. Okay, next one. So how do you then prepare yourself for kids entering the classroom? So I want you to put it in the chat and then we'll kind of go through this at the end as well too. And so you could share with one another, like, what are you most concerned about with your kids, your child entering preschool or kindergarten? I know some of you had uh, written to me on Instagram and Facebook saying, okay, I have a kid that's going into first grade or second grade. 
and we're going to address kind of mostly the preschool and kindergartners, but this applies to kids of all the early years, really, because there are concerns that parents have, you know, can, will my kid be too quiet? Will they be too anxious? Will they be able to speak up for themselves? Will, will they stay safe? Will they make friends? Will they be bullied or picked on? And so there's a lot of things from a psychological perspective that parents are concerned about from a social perspective, um, not just academics. School is not just about academics, right? So here are kind of a highlight of a few things that I see over and over again in my practice as a psychologist, as a parent coach, what I see um, that I think prepares kids the best when they're starting school or re-entering school. The first thing is reading daily. This is so important. Uh, reading is such a way of uh, it, kids engage in social interaction. They feel taken care of. They feel nurtured. They learn reciprocal communication that I speak or you, and you speak. They learn how to read um, and anticipate what's going on next in the book, even if they can't literally read it, that this character is doing something and his face looks this way. Ooh, look what's happening. What do you think is going to happen next? I don't know. Let's see. Turn the page. Okay. Now you tell me what's going on here. Like it's a lot of that is going on. And they learn that. They learn the structure of what school is like. They learn how the give and take of interactions. They learn to love reading and engaging um, in different ways. So I think that's really, really uh, uh, super important. Um, yeah. One of the things that I have on here in the picture are the emotions. Um, the motion book that I really, really love because I see a lot of these flip books for numbers and letters and I'm like, okay, well, that's nice. I mean, lots of people do that. But this, the emotions book, I really love this because it's showing kids different emotions and there it's labeling the emotion. It's showing it like an emoji and it's showing a child's face. I don't see many books like this. And I love that about this because um, these flip books are really cool because it's easy for little hands to turn, little fingers, and it's giving them a view of what it looks like emoji life and also what it might look like in a child. Um, uh, happy, you know, what does that look like? And, you know, things like excited and what that looks like. And I love this because this is part of social emotional learning. It's part of emotional regulation. Kids, I find, will have an easier time, a less difficult time transitioning into school or going back to school when they have more emotional awareness, more emotional intelligence, and they're able to articulate how they feel. And maybe they may not be able to say it fully, but I think books like these and conversations like these with different books is a great way to start. So whether it's this book or whether it's whatever book that talks about emotions and bringing in the faces and the words and the actual emotional words written on the book that your kids and you could talk about, I think that's a great place to start. The second thing is establishing a routine. So I know that it's July and the last thing you wanna think about is your kids going back to school or maybe you are. <laughs> maybe you're like, I can't wait for them to go back to school. But the, the bottom line is that even though we're kind of in the middle of the summer and it may be a whole month or two before they go back, establishing a routine um, now is really important. Uh, one to two weeks before at the minimum is important where they're waking up at a certain time. They're having meals at a certain time that if there's screen time, it's happening at a certain time. The bedtime routine, what is the routine? What is the, the sequence of events? What is the actual bedtime? What are you doing at bedtime? And if you can start this at least two weeks prior to starting school, because once they go to kindergarten, even preschool, most places have a routine. They have a time when the kids check in, putting away their cubbies. Maybe they have outside time. They have reading time. They have their little stations. They go outside for recess or playtime. Now they have the centers. There, there's all this. There's a routine. There's a structure to their day. And so the, the big thing that I see for a lot of preschoolers and kindergartners when they go to school is that they have a really hard time with that transition. If they've been in a home where it's just kind of a free for all, kind of just winging it as you go, because then they have a hard time then knowing that, oh, this is when I nap, this is when I go potty, this is when I you know, rest, this is when I read. So getting them in the routine of having a routine is really, really key. Okay, next slide. 
The other thing is creating a family visual calendar. Uh, we started this with my family and we've done it off and on. And whenever we get away from it, I notice that there's more chaos. Because when kids can see and they can plan for what's happening next, okay, what's going on today? Or something that's out of routine. Okay, I'm taking you to school, but I'm picking you up early because you gotta go to the doctor or to the dentist or to a play date or whatever it is that they have an idea of what's happening. Because again, that's another executive function skill that's planning, that's that's planning ahead, looking ahead to see how can I um, integrate these things into my day. It, it also develops flexibility because this is the routine that I'm used to, but then things are gonna change today. Things are gonna change this week. Um, daddy's picking you up rather than mommy, or the nanny is getting you and taking you to the park rather than coming home right away. And so having a family visual calendar is key, even for kids before they can speak fully, having a visual calendar with the words, the pictures, and they know what to expect. You can do this on a dry erase board. You're gonna do it on a poster board. We got a fridge when we moved into our new house, house that has a screen with a calendar. Like if you wanna get fancy, you could do it that way too. But having a visual calendar is a lifesaver. And then the fourth thing is make family meetings and check-ins part of your family routine and family culture, which means like check in, like let them know that, hey, um, like my kids right now are in math camp. They love that. They're 10 and 13. And so, well, you know, being sarcastic, but, you know, letting them know that, hey, mommy's going to be in a presentation for the next hour. If you need anything, ask daddy or, you know, um, hey, you have volleyball practice this morning and then tomorrow we have this, you know, this weekend we're going to go see this movie, you know, have talking about these things, checking in with them. Hey, I'm gonna be working late tonight and so I'll be seeing you right before bedtime. So checking in with your family, having meetings at the beginning of the week so that they can anticipate and they know what's happening. Having that as part of your family culture is key. Whenever I've met with families that don't do this, check in, and they're just kind of winging it all the time and the kids never know who's going to be there who's going to put them to bed who's going to show up when is the parent going to come home uh, it creates a lot of chaotic feelings and it creates a sense of uh, lack of security they don't know what to expect so we want to help our kids anticipate uh, what's happening okay next slide all right, so then what to do now to prepare um, and preparing your preschooler so there's a few things that I think uh, is gonna be important. Um, I think that we're talking about all about what to do with your kids and how to like set up your family. I think it's also important to prepare yourself. Like, how do you feel about your little bitty one going to school, maybe for the first time? Um, they're not their, your little baby anymore and they're kind of getting, they're being a bit big kid and they're doing things apart from you, maybe for three hours or for a full day. Um, and so how do you prepare yourself mentally for that transition so that you um, are feeling like, okay, yeah, I, I got this. Um, I need to grieve this process because that grieving process is real. Whether your kid is um, moving on to daycare, going on to kindergarten, going on to high school or college, all of that is a transition period. And it's normal to feel sad and excited at the same time and any mix of feelings in between. So uh, I think regulating your own emotions about that and being aware of that, talking to a friend, a family member, your partner, your spouse about these things, I think is going to be important for you. So because the, why this is so key is parental and caregiver anxiety and worries and mood uh, is felt by our kids. So if you're feeling overly anxious, overly worried, you're feeling helicoptery or snow plowy, or you're just really worried and you're just like looking through the window as you drop them off and you're like really concerned, they're gonna pick up on that. And so being aware of your own emotions um, and how you feel about the situation with them going to school or daycare is gonna be important to check in with yourself as well too. So again, these, um, one of the things is preparing is social and emotional learning. Now I highlighted this earlier. This is the nesting fruit friends from learning resources. And I just love these toys so much. I wish my kids were younger. Um, and this one is really cute because it's like this, just it's again, like it's one thing after the other. And what I really like about this, what I see, because I like using play with the kids that I see in therapy. And one of the things that I see with this particular toy is a lot of compare and contrast. And that is really important for social and emotional learning. I mean, it keeps going. I think this is the last one. 
Um, so there's a lot of compare and contrast. Okay, well, which one is bigger? Which one is bigger than the other? Okay, which one? Okay, one is purple and one is red. Yes, one is sad, one is happy. Oh my goodness, one eye is closed and one eye is open. That's the compare and contrast, like looking at how things are different. Um, looking at opposites as well too, happy and sad, um, dark and light. Um, big and small. So all of these things are a really great way of looking at opposites as well, too. Those are all good preparation for preschool and kindergarten. Um, also, emotional awareness, you know, being aware, well, how do you know this one is happy? And this one is, I don't know, confused? What's that emotion? Oh my gosh, I don't know. Maybe it's scared. Maybe it's angry. Yeah. Okay, well, how do you how do you know? How do you know when someone is scared? How do you know when someone is disappointed? How do you know when someone is bored? How do you know when someone is surprised? You know, having those discussions, you know, and even uh, what I talk to parents a lot about is um, doing self-talk out loud because kids often, they see that there's a struggle, but they just see then there's a resolution. And all of a sudden, the adult has figured it out. And I think it's really important for them to hear you speak it out loud. Darn it, I was going to make some soup today, chicken soup. I don't have any chickens. <laughs> hmm, I don't have any chicken in the freezer. I wonder what I can do instead. Well, I can either order it online or, you know what, let me pivot and do something different. Like, like literally talking out the problem and then the steps toward the solution because that builds a lot of emotional regulation, emotional awareness, emotional expression, so that they can see, you know, that you were frustrated, and that you were stuck, and now there's a resolution. And I remember when my son had noticed when he was a toddler, and he was like, oh, adults have problems too? And I was like, yes, yeah, sweetheart. And just being able to hear that we have problems and we work it out. But how do you work it out? Talking it out loud as well, too. That builds a lot of social emotional learning. Okay, next slide. Um, the, the next one is preparing for kindergarten with social emotional. Okay, and this one, oh my gosh, I love this so much. Um, this one I've used with um, my intern and my practice. And there's a couple here of the be kind cubes and the conversation cubes. Um, so the be kind cubes, conversation cubes, and I love these. I love the texture of them and I love the different colors. And really um, what it is, it's really, uh, we've used this a lot for kids in our therapy practice who say that emotions aren't their thing and they don't talk um, really um, easily about emotions or hard topics. And I love this because it has like, what kind of music do you like? Where would you like to travel? Name one thing you can't live without. What foods do you like? Uh, what is your happiest memory? Name a movie you like. Uh, what else do we got here? Um, if you were an animal, what kind would it be? Name a time when you were scared. Name a time when you were sad. Who is the athlete you like best? When is your birthday? So it has these, you know, easy, safe kind of questions, and then maybe some of the like deeper, hard questions. And what I talked to my intern about is like being able to do turn taking with the kid. So maybe even roll it, you know, roll it and see which one comes up. Okay, what makes you unique? And then the therapist shares it and then the kid shares it as a parent as a family during your family meetings you could do this as a game like okay we're going to each answer four questions or you choose a color and we roll the die you know um you could do it in a classroom setting with your preschoolers and kindergartners um but i just i absolutely love this i put this in um a clear container that i got on sale but to put them all in but this is a great one because again it's about helping your child express how they feel I didn't like going to school today, mommy. Oh, why? Tell me more about not liking to go to school today. I felt sad that I was away from you. I felt um, I felt angry that you were at home with baby sister and I was at school bored away from you. Those are good ways of expressing that maybe it's something you don't want to hear, but it's something that they have to express. And these uh, give them a really good way of doing it that is very kind of structured. Another one that I like. Um, is um, grab that donut. This is a really great one, not just because I love donuts, but also because I think this is so, so stinking cute. And so, you know, basically it's a um, little donut shop. And this is great for fine motor skips because they're picking up the different things 
and the eclairs and the donuts and the all these things, and not to mention that they're super cute. And so, you know, picking these up and using, you can use anything. You can use blocks, you can use objects, you can use whatever you have in your home, um, toys that already exist, getting, you know, little pongs that are small enough for their little hands that they can use to pick up. That's really great for fine motor skills, for drawing, for coloring, um, for picking up things, for buttoning their clothes, for zipping things up. Um, these are all really, really great because these things, this, the, the cubes really build a lot of conversational skills that someone shares and then I share. And then I ask more questions about it. And it, it's about perspective taking that I can, I can like a movie and the, someone likes a completely different movie or they like this sport and I don't like that sport at all. Or I can see why they would like it. Uh, it also builds kind of accepting responsibility that, okay, well, I will accept, accept responsibility for the way that I feel and how I respond to people when they share what they feel. The grab the donut really builds a lot of those fine motor skills, the turn taking, frustration tolerance, because maybe their pincer grasp isn't really great. Maybe they are not very coordinated and they feel clumsy, but it also helps with like impulse control, waiting your turn. Okay, well, it's daddy's turn first and then sissy goes next and then you go next. Um, and so I, I love that for this because it's really about using whatever you have in your home to build these skills. So whether it's these toys, whether it's toys you already have, whether it's things you find outside in the yard, like it's about building these skills so that they learn these same skills as they prepare. Okay, next slide. Also, introduction to basic skills, like how do you prepare? So preschool, like I mentioned several times with these books. So I, I shared about the, um, the emotions book, but the flip book has several books that are in the pack. They have one on time. Um, and again, it looks at like what the time is and it's sharing it uh, specifically, uh, looking at talking to them about what the time is. How do you know what time this is? I love this. And really when my kids were little, I don't remember finding a lot of books like this. And I'm bummed that I didn't have this. <laughs> um, and then even like with spelling, giving them early exposure to how things are spelled, what they look like, what the letters look like, how they're formed. Um, all of these things are really, really great. So I think these flip books are great for the preschoolers and for the kindergartners. This, you have add and subtract. Now, again, this might be a little bit early for them, but really it's about exposing them, showing them different things. And you can do this by showing it to them and then bringing out different objects. I have seven, I take away two, how many do I have? Yeah, seven minus two is five. So we're just kind of, just early exposure. They don't, don't have to be this like total savant and be mastering all of these things, but it's giving them exposure to things, numbers. And so I like these because it has the what, the words, the sight words, the counting, the emotions, the letters, the time. So any kind of book like this that's small, that's indestructible, spiraled, and that they can turn on their own and they can use on their own is, is going to be key. So whether it's from here or anywhere else, things that you already have, making sure their tiny hands can use them so they don't get so frustrated with it. Um, because a lot of this with preschool is about letter and number recognition and being able to un identify that this is a letter, this is a number, knowing that something with something creates something else, knowing that, oh, these letters together form words, okay? So they don't have to know exactly what word it is, but understanding that these go together. Okay, next slide. Um, also, so another thing is like the, um, mini, the mini number treats. See, I have these here. I love this one because it's just about counting. So again, it's not, the kids don't have to know it all, but it's being able to help them learn how to count up to that. And when you, you can be kicking with them, when you're um, uh, fixing a snack, being able to count, okay, how many cookies do you want? One, two, three, three cookies. All right, let's see, how many carrots are we going to get? and just bringing it to them. And so these, again, using items like this that are really colorful, that are cute, putting them in a bin, having them in the bin and working through. You can use whatever objects that you have with you. Um, while you're walking, taking a walk, how many rocks did we collect? How many flowers, how many pieces of trash did we pick up? That you can use counting skill for anything. The other thing that I like about this specifically though, it's, it's matching. So you're being able to, you're looking at the number 
the five, and then matching it to like five butterflies for this one. So these two go together. So anything that you can find with that. So you can even have, you know, the number five in a card and then having five rocks and say, putting those together and counting them one by one by one. Um, so that's a really, really uh, great one that you can use. Again, these are just basic skills that you can use with your kiddos. This next one is super cute. I love this thing. It's bento. Let's go bento. And it's the counting up and down. And I, I just love it because I think it's so cute. It's like a little um, bento box. It's like a little lunch box. And again, it's really about counting up and down. It's in addition to being cute, looking at emotions, talking about the different emotions, the play pretzels and, and sorting them in the different places in the box, putting things together. How would you put it together? Again, that's planning, sorting, there's puzzles in there, um, tapes, all of these different kinds of things, you know, finding ways you can use your own lunchbox and find different shapes, different tools, different, you know, play food and create your own little lunchbox or bento box. So I think those are things that are really important to really help kids see okay, how can I do this? How can I plan ahead? How can I use these tools? And then putting those all together. Okay, next one. All right, so then let's talk about, okay, we talk about how to prepare them. Let's talk about what happens when the school day ends. That's the call that I get a lot from parents, especially parents of three and four-year-olds. That's the biggest age group I get the most calls from, that and teenagers. Um, so once the school day ends, I have several categories of these kids that I'm gonna go through and talk about like what, um, what these look like. Okay, so you pick them up and they're moody. You got the moody child. Why are they moody? Well, the mental stimulation of a school environment, especially if they've been home, maybe just with you or just with their sister or brother, there's a lot of things going on at school. The teachers, the announcements, the play, the kids screaming, someone hitting them, taking their toy. There's a lot of mental stimulation. There's the social stimulation from interactions that can be draining. There's learning how to regulate. They're trying to figure out, I'm really mad that you just took my toy and I wanna hit you, but I know I was told don't oh, hit, use gentle hands. <laughs> and then separation from the parents and caregivers, like being separated from you, maybe being mad that you left them. So um, these are all reasons why your kid might be moody. So now what, what do you do about it? So you anticipate that, you talk about that. That's why these family meetings are so important. You tell them about what might happen. You tell them about what you notice. You know, I notice, mommy notices that when she picks you up, that you're feeling, maybe you're not sure how you feel, that what your face tells me is that you're looking down, that I see tears coming out of your eyes, that you're screaming and hitting me. I wonder what's going on in your little mind. Like being able to talk to them about that, being able to maybe not knowing exactly what their emotions are, but describing their behavior that you see, not from a judgmental perspective, but from like a sports casting, a descriptive perspective. This is what I'm seeing. I wonder if you need a hug from mommy. I wonder if you maybe need a smile. I wonder if, um, you want me to come a little bit earlier, whatever it is, but being able to talk them through it and be able to see like what's really going on and what makes it better and what makes it worse. So if you show up a little bit earlier, if you come a little bit later, if you come with snacks, if you do some volunteering in the classroom, if you hang back a little bit while they separate, like what is it that makes it better, what makes it worse uh, and seeing and getting feedback from the teacher or the preschool uh, provider as well too. Okay, next slide. Then we have the, um, the I don't want to leave child. <laughs> you have some kids that are like, why you come back? Like I was having a good old time. And some reasons could be maybe they were having meaningful social interactions. Maybe they love, they're a highly social introverted kid and they love being around all these other kids. Um, maybe they had mixed feelings about being dropped off and they're kind of angry at you for leaving them. Uh, maybe they're wondering what they missed apart from you, and so they don't want to leave because they have these, again, these mixed feelings about it. Maybe they're, they're, well, not maybe, they are concrete thinkers, meaning very literal, very here and now, and they don't know what's next, maybe because you didn't have the family meeting, maybe because they never know that maybe pickup is kind of crazy and chaotic and they never know what's next, and they're frantic and you're always running late and you're, you know, going to the next thing. 
So they don't want to leave because they like the comfort and the peace and the slowness maybe of the environment that they're in. So again, what now what is that's why these family calendars and um, planning those things in advance is so important and talking those talking it through with them in advance so that they understand what to expect and um, they know that this is when I'm going to be dropping you off and this is when I'm picking you up or this is who's picking you up and this is who's dropping you off. Okay, next one. Then we have the I'm hungry child. I had this a lot with my son when we was little one. So these are the kids that every time you pick them up, they're, the first thing they say is not, hey, how are you moms? They're like, where's my food at? So this one is hunger is a basic need that leads to dysregulation. Dysregulation is being unbalanced. And um, so if you're hungry, yeah, you're gonna have that hangry kind of attitude and you're gonna have this, you know, tension between you and your caregiver. Um, saying that they're hungry is also a way to connect with you. Maybe they're not literally hungry, but that's a way of feeling nurtured of this is what I want from you. Um, maybe they're not used to a meal schedule. Maybe they're used to grazing all day long and eating whatever the heck they want, which is very common for the summer. It's very common when kids are home all day. They just eat whenever they feel like it. Uh, and so maybe they're just not used to being deprived of not eating every hour, every 30 minutes. Or maybe they just didn't like, did not like the foods and snacks that were served in kindergarten or uh, preschool, and they're hungry. They're starving. They're they have a headache. Their stomach is upset. They got a poop. They have a beetle. They, like maybe they have all these things that are going on um, because their basic needs weren't met, and they just feel kind of cranky. So now what? You ask about that. Ask about the meals that are served. Ask about the um, what you know. Ask the providers, like, is my child eating throughout the day? When are the times that there's that your things are being served? Um, how much are they eating? Are they picking at it? Are they taking too long to eat because they're socializing? Like, find out more about what's going on so you can kind of gauge because maybe they're eating um, too soon and they're not hungry the time they're eating. So by the time that they are ready to eat, it meal time is over. Like, there's all these different factors. So ask, ask about it and find out and get a gauge, track it. You know, when is it better? When is it worse? Um, and, and so forth. Okay, next one. Then you've got the uh, after school meltdowns. This one is the beast, right? Because these are kids, you pick them up and as soon as you see them, they are melting down and screaming and crying. And then of course it doesn't help because the daycare provider was like, well, he was fine all day until you showed up. <laughs> we got that a lot. I was like, that is not helpful. Please do not share that information. Um, so the after school meltdowns is a big part of meltdowns. It's not a tantrum. The tantrum is I want this red plate and you gave me the blue one. It's a specific desire that I want that you didn't give me. That's different. Meltdowns are a nervous system dysregulation issue. It's that I've gotten overheated, overtired, over hungry, overstimulated, whatever it is. And my nervous system, I now see you, my secure other attachment figure. And now I know it's safe to let it all out. Mommy, my day was terrible. And they don't say it in words, but you sure see it in their behavior. So it's a way that their system is kind of dysregulated. And they know that now it's okay to show it. Okay, It's actually an honor for them to have a meltdown in front of you. You may have heard that before. It still doesn't make you feel any better. Um, there's also, they may have mixed feelings about your absence, that they feel like, you know, the nerve, you had to drop me off and then you don't come pick me up. And yes, now I'm going to melt down and show you how upset I am about, about the whole situation. Maybe they're unsure about how to pro process their day. Like maybe they had a rough day with another kid or a teacher or provider. Um, with maybe their body is hurting in some way or, or uncomfortable in some way, but they don't have the words. Maybe they're pre-verbal. Maybe they're, they don't have the verbal sophistication or the, the emotional language uh, and they don't know how to process it. And so what happens is the regression back to a prior developmental stage, which means if you have like a three, a four, a five-year-old and they're having a hard time, what happens is that they go back to a previous stage when they feel like all their emotions are out of whack and they don't know how to process it. And our early, earlier developmental stage at that point is crying, crying and screaming. That's how you got your needs met. That's how you're able to express yourself. So even if you have a verbal kid, you may find that they act kind of like a baby and they may use baby talk. They may start to hit and scream and bite in ways that you're like, how are you doing this? You're four years old. That's you're a big kid. Well, they're regressing because they feel off. They feel dysregulated. 
Okay, next slide. Sorry, no, 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 let's go with that. So with that, sorry, um, with that, what we wanna do is we want to be able to be present with them and just sit with it with them. Because if you start to get emotionally dysregulated while they're dysregulated, what I always say when I do my parent coaching sessions is a dysregulated parent cannot regulate a dysregulated child. Now it's easier said than done, okay? I totally get it. But it's really important when you see your kids start to melt down in your presence that you don't start to melt down in their presence, that you introduce the calm in the middle of it. So maybe if you know this is how they're going to respond on certain days or every day, that you show up a little bit earlier or you allow yourself more wiggle room to commute and leave um, uh, more wiggle room so that you know that you're not rushing to do the next thing and you can give them time to have that meltdown and sit with them in that until they're able to breathe through that okay so the the biggest biggest now what for the meltdowns is your parental regulation and your presence and your calm okay next one screen time this is the big one big big one now screen time is a great wind down tool it's a great babysitter it is but it, there is a huge problem of dysregulation especially with this age group they will lack onto it especially if it's a very stimulating thing especially youtube but a lot of these children's shows are very very overstimulating and they're fast and they're loud and the commercials are no no better so when you have a kid who's already dysregulated hungry tired overstimulated and maybe just melted down and then you plop them in front of the screen yes it gives you a break but it's going to lead to more dysregulation also the challenging issue of then moving from the screen to dinner the screen to bath the screen to bedtime is going to be a beast so really that's gonna those are all the kinds of things that make it really bad plus the dopamine the dopamine is your feel good your pleasure um chemicals in your brain and tv screens that floods the brain with that especially an immature brain so all of that is why screen time can be so so terrible especially excessive overstimulating screen time for this um, population so then now what? That's why schedules are important. We don't need a rigid schedule, but we want to have a schedule where they can predict and they know how much time. So if they have screen time, let it be very specific. You can have screen time from 5 to 5.30, or you can watch one show so that it's not this like click, 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 click streaming device or video games where never ending, you know, levels, that it's very specific start and stop time from a show, for a time period, a timer, whatever it is, okay? Um, make it very specific and that way they know what to expect. Okay, next, next one. Uh, meal times. So again, you're going to see exhaustion, overstimulation, and over, over hungry kids. The schedule is really important and even planning a meal schedule and in, in kind of collaborating with them on that. What would they like to eat for the week and planning that out. Having items that they already like, especially if you have a kid who's a little bit picky, and introducing new items. The eating research shows, especially for little ones, it takes 15 average of introductions of a new food or a food for them to start liking it. And then that's in different ways. So peach cobbler, peach, uh, raw peaches, canned peaches, fresh peaches, frozen peaches, peach smoothie, peach cut up, peach whole, <laughs> like having different um, introductions of the same food over and over it so just because they don't like it once twice five times you keep introducing it different ways different times over time so we want to make sure that we're expanding our kids palette over time uh, and making sure that they're not um, getting into a state of being over hungry because then we'll see more meltdowns okay next one um, then we have um, the last ones are we have bedtime routines and bedtime delays. Now, one of the biggest reasons for bedtime dilly dallying and over silliness and what they call the witching hour, which is typically 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. I know it's familiar to many of you. Um, that's when kids seem like they're losing their minds. They get screamy and yelly and they're running all over. They're getting overly, overly hyper and silly, giggly, um, disobedient, not listening to instructions, um, being uh, overly playful in the bathtub, just like it's just 
like it's like their the, their volume has been turned up and many times these bedtime dilly dallies and bedtime delays are because they don't want to be separated from you and even if they're quote misbehaving what it does is that it gives them more time with you it's a great tactic okay Sometimes it's because they're overstimulated. Maybe they've just been on screen watching Coco Melon and Caillou and they're like overly stimulated um, and overly tired. Maybe they missed their window for bedtime and uh, and they're just they're just losing their minds. So what we want to do is make bedtime fun, but not overstimulating. OK, so be playful, engage with them. You know, oh, I'm going to wrap you up like a burrito. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take you to the, you know, the bedroom and I'm going to put you in the bed and I'll tuck you in. and I'll give you a massage, like make it playful, make it unexpected. What you want to do is help them regulate. If they're flailing and moving everywhere, then maybe coming in and giving them a yummy bear hug, wrapping them in the, the, the uh, blanket. Be engaging with it. Um, don't get into always correcting and overcorrecting and yelling and nagging at them. That's just going to escalate and it's going to allow more of a bedtime dilly dallying to engage with you more. Um, so all of that kind of stuff is going to be super important with them. So that way you can kind of wind down the day. Okay, next one. I think that's our last one. So these, uh, this QR code, if you scan it with your phone, what you'll find is all my favorites um, that I listed here on learning resources if you're interested, or you can look and find equivalent things in your own environment to um, mimic those things. We want to really make sure that you're not just buying a bunch of products um, and adding more stuff to your space, but you're doing things with intentionality. That's always really important to me, whether it's in my office space, with my home, and with my kids, with the people that I meet with. Doing things with intentionality so that you're giving your kids the space to learn, to grow, to interact, um, and they feel like they're getting something out of it. So, um, so I would encourage you to scan that and look at all my favorites on my um, the Amazon um, page um, and shop and finding the things that you like the best. Um, and what I encourage you to do too is whatever you do get, wherever you get them, have toys on a rotating schedule so that way everything has its place and kids can then tap into something and then you remove it, have something new, and they're like, oh, it's like a brand new toys all over again. So that way they don't get overstimulated and their space doesn't get over cluttered. And then this is my website, a new day. Uh, oops, I mistyped that. It should be a new day SA, not a new dia, a new day SA.com. And, and that's my practice. I offer parent coaching. My team and I offer parent coaching for parents all over the world um, for a variety of issues from two year olds all the way up to college age and adults, uh, as well um, as resources, support, education whatever it is that you need. We don't believe in parents doing this alone. Parenting is hard enough as it is. And if we're not able to help you, we will be able to um, direct you to somebody else who can. So um, yeah, so let's open it up for uh, questions and that way we can answer any questions that you all have. Dr. Ann Louise, Dr. thank you so much. So the first question that we have is, what differences are you noticing in kids' behaviors and learning due to the isolation experience from the pandemic? Oh, that's a great question. I was talking about this yesterday with a group of college administrators, and I think I see it similar uh, in that age group as well as the younger ones. Uh, a big thing that I'm seeing is a lot of um, uh, emotional and behavioral uh, dysregulation. Um, which is affecting learning, because if you aren't able to regulate yourself and you're not able to manage your emotions, your feelings and your internal state, then you're not going to learn. Um, and so I'm seeing a lot of problems with that um, and a lot of problems with social interactions. I see a lot of little kids who don't know how to interact with their peers due to the, a lot of the isolation, especially if they've been at home for the past two, three years that they're coming into school not feeling as equipped socially for a lot of that stuff that I talked about, like perspective taking, turn taking, sharing, kind of just even having a conversation, how to play with another kid, because they've either been playing with their parents or siblings uh, or by themselves. And so they don't they don't really have a lot of those skills, which is impacting how they learn at school. So um, so, yeah, that's what I'm seeing a lot. 
Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next one is, what are the most common problems you see with children entering a classroom for the first time? Oh, good question. So um, I think probably the most common thing that I'm hearing and seeing, I think is the um, uh, lots of social anxiety. We're getting, especially in my practice, we're getting a lot of calls from parents of two, three, four-year-olds with social anxiety. And I'm just like, wow, that's really young to have social anxiety. Like that's a big claim and big word. Some kids might feel like quote shy or more worried or hesitant, but I'm seeing more and more kids going into school just like, like terrified of going to school. Um, a lot of social anxiety and a lot of separation anxiety. So they don't want to be separated from their parent or caregiver. Um, and it's creating a very drawn out drop off process. And, um, and it's creating a lot of problems for them. Like they're literally stomach problems, diarrhea, crying uncontrollably. And so I'm seeing a lot of that emotional type stuff with social and, and anxiety stuff. Next is, if I see my child struggling in a certain area, such as fine motor, math, or language, what do you suggest are the first steps we can take to combat this? Um, so what I would say is, I think as a parent, it's important to always listen to your gut, because I think sometimes um, people might think, oh, you're just, you're being too, you know, um, neurotic as a parent, but I, I think it's important for us to listen to our gut. So if you see that your kid is might, might be lagging behind a, a little bit, it's normal for some kids to be further ahead than other peers and some of normal for them to be lagging behind and normal for them to be right on target. So there is this range of normal for lots of kids. When it becomes abnormal is when it's significantly impacting their functioning. So you have a four or five year old who's not speaking at all or you, they're having a hard time, they don't potty, they're not potty trained at all. They're not even having any interest in doing it. And they're like now entering, you know, um, uh, being four or five years old, uh, constantly having accidents, not writing properly or having any desire to do it, or they seem very sloppy or poor grip. But just notice those kinds of things. And then speak to your pediatrician, like, Ask them like, hey, this is what I'm noticing. Is this within the normal range for my three-year-old, for my two-year-old, for my four-year-old? Um, and don't just wait for the answer like, oh, they're, they'll find, they'll catch up. If you really feel like there's something not right, ask for a referral to a physical therapist if you notice a lot of clumsiness or hard time with walking and coordination. Um, ask for a referral for an occupational therapist if you see a lot of issues with fine motor and grasping and spinning and sensory motor stuff. Um, and for to a speech therapist, if you're noticing problems with pragmatic speech, like forming sentences or knowing how to speak, um, how to form words, if they're lisping, if they're um, tongue tied, if they're, um, you know, not saying words properly, like ask for those referrals, because the worst that can happen, the least that can happen is they say, you know what, no, your kid is right where they're supposed to be, or maybe they're lacking behind, let's watch or let's do an evaluation, let's do a few speech therapy or physical therapy sessions. But I would just say, listen to your gut, go to the pediatrician and then ask for a specific referral, especially to speech, occupational or physical therapy. And then if you think there's more emotional issues going on, especially if there's lots of anxiety, like I mentioned, there's a divorce, there's been a death, there's been something tragic in their, the kid's life or that is interpreted as tragic for the kid, then seek out a child psychologist or child therapist. So um, I, don't, I, I think it cannot be understated, overstated rather, to seek out help from a specialist if you really feel like something's off. Thank you. This Thank next you. question says, my child has high anxiety about being bullied for her beliefs. Do you have any advice? Hmm. Um, I would say I love the role playing with kids. So first find out from them what they believe, have them say it out loud to you and have them rehearse it kind of like their elevator pitch if they, if they will, so that they can feel like this is my sense of conviction. This is what I believe, believe. Um, and then doing a role play doing a role play of like, okay, well, what if someone comes up to you and says this, what would you say back? And you can either, you can even flip it. They can be the other kid being the bully and you could be your child 
role playing and modeling how to respond. So I, I would say that either doing it directly role playing or like I mentioned earlier in play, using it in the play setting, bring out the different dolls, different miniatures in a dollhouse uh, and bring it out so that it's done in a play setting or in a role play. That's rehearsal is one of the best ways because it tricks your brain into thinking that you've already done the thing. And so that's what I would recommend. That's great advice, thank you. What action can parents take to encourage play as a form of learning? I think it's important not to make it feel like it's learning. Because uh, if kids feel like it's like, okay, from two to 225, we're gonna do our play activity. It's because we're gonna learn about social emotional learning. Like if you do that, it's gonna be boring and it's gonna be pointless. So I would say, make it fun, keep it engaging and integrating things that are playful, that are engaging without making it feel like you're teachy. Um, and don't make everything a learning experience, a teachable experience, because then that'll get old and it'll, turn them off to it. So be engaging, be fun, and try to find different ways of doing things that you can subtly add the learning into it without it feeling very explicitly learning. That's, I think that's my biggest advice. And I do that a lot in play therapy, um, that you don't make it feel like they're actually doing the thing because they're having so much fun doing it. Okay, the last question here is, is there anything you advise children to keep in their backpacks or bring to school to help them feel comfortable as they enter school for the first time? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would I would ask the child. Um, that's what we call in therapy a, um, uh, well, transitional object is one, but it's kind of like a grounding, kind of something that helps them feel grounded, that helps them feel connected. So maybe it's a lovey, maybe it's a stuffed toy, it's a blanket, maybe it's an object, a picture of their parents. Um, maybe it's something that they've made that has a part, you know, maybe it's like they go to a, a store and they they make something and with their parents, uh, a bracelet, um, a book, it could be anything, but I would say do this collaboratively with your kid and finding out what helps them feel most connected to home and their parent. Um, this, there's a theory and uh, concept in psychology called theory of mind. And one of the explanations is that people love when they feel like they're being thought of. So I might go out somewhere and I see something if I'm traveling. And I'll tell my kids, hey, like when I went to New York City, we went to FAO Schwartz and we saw some cool stuff. And I was thinking about you when I saw this item, even if you don't get it for them, right? Even if you're like, you were thought of, you were being held in my mind. That is really comforting and really sweet for, for someone to know that even in your absence, in my absence, I am being thought of. And I think this object for your kids should be that thing that when they see it, that they know that their parent is thinking of them and they are thinking of their parent and it's a good way to connect. So I would say it could be anything, a book, a bracelet, and a toy, an item, anything. And it's just something you do collaboratively with your kids so that they can have this theory of mind and then it helps them feel settled during the day. Dr. Ann Louise Dr. Lockhart, thank you so much for providing profound insights into back to school readiness. We greatly appreciate you sharing your time and expertise with us today. And to our audience, thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed today's webinar and are taking away with some taking away some new tips and tricks. A few reminders as we wrap up the session, this webinar will be available on learningresources.com and you should also receive an email from GoToWebinar with a link to the recording. Thank you again, everyone, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. See you next time. Thank you. Bye.